Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, Framework Symposium Flash Talk sessions. Uh, my name is Rihanna Aliyati, and I'm happy to be your moderator for this session. Um, I would like to welcome all our uh, talk presenters uh, today in our Flash Talk and for dedicating the time to uh, write these sessions. So the Flash Talk sessions will include um, rapid five to six minutes presentations on some of cutting edge experiences and research on XR and VR that the presenters will be um, sharing with us today. And uh, due to the limited time that we have, since we only have till 4.30 for these flash talks, so um, please, uh, we'll put in your questions in the Q&A function that we have in the webinar, and uh, our presenters um, will kindly be uh, answering them as they come in by typing in the answers. And hopefully, maybe if we have some time at the end, we can answer some of the live questions together. So, and uh, without further ado, uh, we will start with our presenters. And if you can kindly um, give a brief introduction of yourself and, uh, and the project that you'll be talking about. And we will start with the money projects uh, from on-site to web VR exhibitions. And we have Candid and Gabrielle um, today with us. So go ahead. Okay, just a brief presentation. Should I already do the flash talk? <laughs> Yeah, just a brief introduction of who you are and um, yeah, then right. your presentation. Okay. Okay, so my name is Candida Borges, Candida in English. I'm presenting a work about the Transeuntes Mundi project, which is a VR work that I developed as my PhD thesis at the University of Plymouth in the UK. I'm a visiting scholar at Columbia University in New York and an assistant professor at the University of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. So that's my PhD thesis. And Gabriel is my partner on that. Gabriel, you want to say some words also? Yes, I am Gabriel Mario Vélez. I am uh, the Dean of the uh, Fine Arts Faculty in the University of Antioquia. I am artist, visual artist, transmedia artist, and I uh, share the project with Candida. Thank you. Okay, you can go ahead and uh, present your talk. Yes, okay, great. So let's go here. Share my screen here. You guys see my presentation now? Yes? Hope yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay, cool. Can I hear? Oh, okay. Let me go back here. So this is a Transeuntes Mundi project, a nomadic creative practice about the millennial human global journey from on-site to web VR exhibitions. That's the topic we are covering today. Me and Gabrielle, we are the authors of this, representing these universities we mentioned before. The Transeuntes Mundi project proposes to capture the sound and visual memory of peoples, cultures, and cities to tell the story of the millennial passes by that has been crossing the world. In this way, it cur currently portrays the diversity of four countries from four continents and generates an archive of human cultural heritage to be watched nowadays and by future generations. So uh, we started the main piece of our work. We call it a transmedia work, transmedia composition. Uh, and it, it's a virtual reality work developed by the Transatlantic Mundi Project it uses emerging technologies to invite the audience to travel the world and experience the stories of, and diversity of humanity. The first version is named Derive, uh, the Reeve 01, and travels through 14 stories in four continents. Initially, uh, so these are the images of our, of our work, and it's all the field work we did. So some images of our presentation. Our first version so was originally designed to be presented as an on-site exhibition for in-person installations. So it was developed in Unity. Uh, it was designed for the Oculus headsets. And all sections of the, the installation was they were fully immersive and interactive. We were using ambisonic sounds, high resolution image, and they were presented as a performative installation. With the challenge of the COVID uh, pandemic, 
we had to generate an online exhibition for that as we could not uh, reach our audience anymore. So for the online exhibitions, we transferred the, so initially we developed um, a WebGL application that had a similar structure of our um, in-person application. So this was designed for to be web and only for computers. These are the limitations of the WebGL. Then all sections were fully immersive and interactive, just like the in-person one. We had to change the ambisonic sounds to binaural sound, medium resolution image because of the loading time, and non-performative installation as we were just inside people's computer. So then we had, as a result, unknown incompatibilities with some machines. Some computers were not running the work. And we only had that running for computers and not for portable devices. We had also the problem of slow loading times and in general one minute and a half for the application to load in people's computers. And the application was, that was a good point, that was fully independent because it was fully customizable. And now we are in the, in the point that we are, uh, so making the comparison between, between the three, we developed one more new work released next uh, last year, last month, sorry, in which we, tr we were trying to fix the incompatibilities that we had with some machines. So we developed the same, the same work now using WordPress and YouTube structures. Now we reached computers and Android systems. Uh, we had interactive menus, but not uh, fully immersive anymore. The videos, yes. Now we could also come back to ambisonic sounds and back to high resolution image uh, using a fast loading time. And again, we are presenting that in a non-performative installation. The down points are that, uh, so YouTube, uh, the combination of YouTube and WordPress are not for iOS devices. Uh, they are just for computers and mobile uh, Android devices. We have a fast loading time now but we are dependent on YouTube features of, for presentation. Uh, so this is the menu of our presentation. That's the menu that we have in the three versions of our work. And that's it, that's our presentation here. Perfect timing. Thank you, Candid. That's um, very nice. And uh, now to our next presenter, um, the project is Sign Language in Social VR Challenge and um, Adaptations. And Dylan Fox will be presenting to us. Can yes. Hello. Use yourself, Dylan, and go ahead with your presentation. All right. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me all right? Can you see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. We can. We can. Awesome. Uh, so hi, my name is Dylan Fox, uh, and I am a design and accessibility consultant here in Oakland, California. Uh, I'm also a group leader in XR Access, which is an organization uh, dedicated to virtual and augmented reality accessibility. Um, so I'm here at Frameless uh, Symposium to talk to you about sign language in social VR, uh, some challenges and adaptations. So what is social virtual reality? Uh, basically, it's an application where people pilot avatars around an immersive 3D environment and talk to one another. Um, you can kind of think of it like Second Life or The Sims, but in virtual reality. Um, so examples today would be Mozilla Hubs, uh, VRChat, and Altspace VR. Uh, now, the primary forms of communication in social VR today are voice and text, um, which brings us to our main challenge. How can we enable communication for deaf and hard of hearing people in social VR applications? Uh, now, we made an attempt at this um, when we used Mozilla Hubs for the XR Access 2020 Symposium back in July. Um, for a variety of reasons, it didn't work out very well. Uh, and a large part of that is that we didn't properly vet our approach with the deaf community beforehand. So sorry about that. Um, and remember, there's a reason that, that the phrase, nothing about us without us is popular. It's vital to, to consult uh, the community of the people you're trying to help. Um, but for now, let's look at some of the possible solutions uh, that we found. So first and foremost is improved hand tracking. Um, this is taking hand input from an Oculus controller or a leap motion device um, or any other type of sensors and translating it into VR. Um, this has the major benefit of being the most intuitive and naturalistic approach for a lot uh, of deaf and hard of hearing people to communicate. Um, and you can see on the right here, we have a clip from a game called Tacoma uh, that shows maybe what this could look like in the future. 
Um, when, when it comes to hand tracking as well, uh, we should make a note that the conventions of sign language might actually need to be adjusted to accommodate holding a controller. Um, you can see here uh, on this clip from VR chat uh, how a number of deaf users uh, figure that out for themselves. Um, I'll play the clip here. I wanted to make this video with my friend to show you the differences when comparing real life sign language and VR sign language because of the limitations that controllers have. Um, so never underestimate uh, pe people's ability to take accessibility into their own hands. Um, now, an important aspect of sign language as well is communicating facial expression. Um, it can actually be very difficult to tell what someone is signing from their hands alone. Um, communicating body language is very important. Um, you can see here on the right that Facebook was actually experimenting with this as early as 2016. Um, and now this could be something that's triggered by a button, uh, by you know, a motion, by facial recognition. Um, but however it's done, it should be sure to respect people's privacy and be tested with uh, deaf folks to make sure it's compatible with sign language. Um, now, a stopgap measure that could be effective is this idea of pinning a webcam feed to an avatar. Um, you see here we have my avatar on the right and the webcam feed of me above it. Uh, if I were walking around like this, you'd be able to see me doing sign language. Um, now, a pro of this is that it's technologically not hard to implement. Uh, Mozilla Hubs is actually pretty close to doing this already. Um, but the reason I call it a stopgap measure is that it, this approach really kind of classifies deaf and hard of hearing people as second class citizens. Um, you know, you're 2D in a 3D world. You can't really use a desktop headset since you have to have a webcam trained on you. And you give up more privacy than other users who don't have to let the world peek into their homes uh, in order just to, to communicate. Um, now those solutions assume that you're on your own, but if you have an interpreter available, then more solutions are possible. Um, it turns out that just having an interpreter in a virtual room with you comes with a lot of problems and challenges. Uh, but, but this illustration from uh, Burke et al's uh, Chat in the Hat paper um, shows the possibility of a remote interpreter that could essentially function as a co-pilot, kind of living in your head and traveling with you, helping you um, communicate with hearing people if you're deaf or hard of hearing. Uh, so a lot of interesting possibilities here for more advanced interpretation systems. Uh, and then last but not least, there's the possibility of automatic captioning. Um, this would be a huge accessibility win for a lot of people, not just deaf and hard of hearing folks. Um, but right now, you basically need either a stenographer um, or pre-captioned content for this to work in VR. Um, you can see on the right here, this is an example of uh, an equal entry meetup in Mozilla Hubs, where they had a stenographer capturing what the person presenting was saying and putting that in a 3D object in the environment. Um, but obviously, that doesn't work as well in a group conversation. Uh, now, of course, also throwing captions everywhere, just having a million different speech bubbles could present a lot of text and occlusion issues. So this is a big both design challenge and uh, machine learning challenge to, to figure out, but would be a huge accessibility win. Um, so that's it. That was a quick look at some of the possible solutions to help deaf and hard of hearing people communicate in VR. Um, thanks for listening. I'm Dylan Fox. You can find me uh, on Twitter at usabilityfox or online at drfoxdesign.com. And if you're interested in this, I would encourage you to check out XR Access, um, Twitter at XR Access and URL xraccess.org. Uh, so thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Dylan. Thank you so much, Dylan. This is an important topic because um, I know we had these same challenges when we were uh, organizing this symposium and um, I am thank you for proposing some of the adaptations that uh, can be used for accommodating our deaf community. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, and uh, so just before we move on to the next presenter, I just wanna remind our participants that you can use the Q&A function to post your questions and uh, the presenters will uh, be answering them either by typing typing them in, or if we have time at the end, we can ask, answer some of these questions live. Um, so our next uh, presenter, uh, Faithful, and you'll be talking about a web-based um, immersive virtual environment for user experience evaluation in the architecture studio. So go ahead, Faithful, present yourself, uh, introduce yourself, and I'll go ahead with your presentation. Uh, yeah, um, so let me get this up. Can you all see this? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so hello everyone. My name is Faithful Oladeji. Um, I am a second year MFA student in the graphic design program 
also known as the Design for Responsible Innovation Program at UIUC in Illinois. Um, and so today I'll be talking briefly about an ongoing project that looks to web-based um, immersive virtual environments for user experience research in the Architecture Studio. And so some background on what motivated this study. Um, prior to being an uh, a student in graphic design, I was an architecture student. And in studying architecture, I quickly developed a concern about how largely disengaged students are from the true experiential qualities of their um, architecture, the, the implications of their designs. In the architecture studio, students are richly educated and develop a solid foundation for justifying the objective qualities of their architecture. But the more subjective user experiential qualities of their designs remain matters of, sub of assumption and speculation. And so research on the use of VR in architectural de design generally um, has rapidly per permeated the profession um, for several decades, um, driven by the prospect of symbolically crossing temporal distances and bringing a legitimate experience of um, a final design to the present at any moment in the design process. And this is a phenomenon akin to um, what David Harvey calls space-time compression in which technology compresses space and time. Um, but today, uh, VR technology um, and its implementation in architectural design remains largely cumbersome, um, requiring multiple high-end components to generate and effectively utilize um, VR. And so in order to remedy this, I began conduct, uh, conducting some preliminary investigations, first to understand uh, what the experiential qualities of architecture are. And these can really be summed up in three general questions. Um, so how does the architecture work? How does the architecture feel? And what does the architecture mean? Um, and then after this, I conducted an, an evaluation of current VR implementation in architecture. Um, so looking at different modes of representation juxtaposed with current VR technologies. Um, and so these initial findings really affirmed that current VR implementation in architecture, again, is largely, largely cumbersome. Um, and this deters its adoption um, in the architecture stu studio. And so students aren't really um, able to use this um, effectively. And so this became the impetus for attempting to make VR more accessible um, and investigating WebXR as a means for doing so. And so an initial prototype um, has been generated um, using an ex existing architectural design project that I did um, in my undergrad, as well as a workflow that marries conventional CAD software. Um, so like Rhino, um, Revit, um, 3JS, which is a JavaScript library for generating web interactions and then the WebXR API. And so here's a look at um, the stereoscopic interface that the viewer would see using a low fidelity headset, um, such as the Google Cardboard. Um, and in this demo, I'm using a head mount display emulator to depict what this might look like for a viewer um, to perceive um, using a low end as, um, headset. And so some next steps on the development of this prototype include fine tuning um, this current rendition um, to include such things as different lighting conditions, um, shadows, other elements to enhance realism, as well as developing immersion components, other immersion components um, that appeal to other senses. And then further um, establishing criteria for practically evaluating user experience in architecture and then developing a model, an adapted model of the current architectural design, design process that centers experience research. And so on the significance of this work, architectural designers are often accused of being um, emotionally distant um, and um, an emotional coldness and a distance from life. Um, and I submit that this is largely due to the modes of representation um, that they employ in their design process. And so designers are afforded views from the outside in using drawings, models, study models, um, and other modes of con conventional representation, but rarely are they um, afforded a view from the inside out. And so in presenting architecture students with, with an accessible and agile means of gaining an inside out perspective 
um, using Web, WebXR, I seek to contribute to enhancing the awareness of future designers um, to the experiential implications of their designs and bridging the gap between their work and the everyday life. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Faithful, and uh, good luck with your important work. And uh, we hope to hear how it has evolved. Um, and next, we're going to uh, um, hear from Wyatt and Mark on uh, mixed reality design. So if you can uh, please briefly introduce yourselves and uh, go on with your presentation. Thank you. Absolutely. Can everyone hear me OK? Yep. Excellent. All right. Let me just share my screen and we will get going. Okay. Can everyone see? Yep, looks good. All right, cool. So, oh, hang on. So my name is Wyatt Coe. I'm an industrial designer. I graduated from RIT's industrial design program in 2019. And I am super interested in how mixed reality can impact the way that we design and experience physical products. So this is kind of a, a high level insight to give you, get you thinking about how mixed reality could interact with the rest of the world and how the rest of the world and the people who design the products within it will react to the introduction of mixed reality as a technology. So technology in a large part defines the way that we design products for people, both in the capabilities of what we can make and how people interact with them. And currently we're using digital products more and more to take the place of physical ones. And software can do many things that hardware can't, but there are some things that hardware does better. So here's an example. <laughs> This is an example of someone who is very clearly in the mode of the digital age, bringing a typical 2D interface into a physical product that's actually adding complexity, which is what we want to avoid. But if we just think about it for a second, if the second augmented reality can be applied to this product, this screen and every other screen that we're using is completely redundant because you can project a user interface, a digital user interface onto any physical product, which opens up a lot of interesting questions. So this is a photo of a designer at Ford using a Microsoft HoloLens to project an alternate front end onto an existing Ford Fusion. And so they're still using this tech to think about how to develop the next version of this physical product. But I took one look at this and started thinking, well, what if this was the end result of the product? What if the visual exterior of the car was digital? And what kind of opportunities does that open up? Because this physical car is so complex and they put a ton of work into sculpting this exterior to make it look attractive. But if that's digital, you could then simplify the physical product way down, making it more sustainable, saving resources, and making more of the physical product experience digital. So now we're really overlapping digital and physical product experiences into one thing. And the cool part about this is it's totally customizable and there are fewer limitations when it comes to creativity. So you can design the sweetest car that is no longer limited by physics and overlay that onto your functional platform and it can look the same to other people, but the other people could use the same base physical structure and transform their own personal experience with software using mixed reality. And this, this goes even further into interactions, which is super interesting to me, because as we saw with that toaster, you're kind of losing out on the one interaction of that lever that you would normally depress. So Tesla made a huge jump forward by taking all of the physical buttons and dials that you would normally find on a car interior and turning that into one software interface on a tablet, but you lose the tactility of interacting with all those buttons and knobs, which can actually be distracting if you're driving. 
in an augmented reality situation, you could have a few buttons and dials and remap different controls onto those couple physical inputs using a software connection, along with changing the appearance of the entire vehicle. And the best part about it is because that's tethered to the hardware that you are wearing, that experience can go with you wherever you go. So you can hop out of one vehicle and into another and take your entire personalized interior with you. And yeah, Mark was instrumental in helping me work on this project, helping me get into the VR lab, get up and running. I actually used virtual reality to design a digital vehicle and overlay it onto a physical prototype that I made. If you wanna read more about it, I have a 60 page book. It's in PDF form and you can find it on my website, wyattco.com. I'm also on Instagram at wyattco.design. Thank you very much. I don't know if you have anything to add, Mark. All right, did a great job. <laughs> yeah, it's looking, looking fantastic. Thanks guys. Thank you, Wyatt. And uh, maybe if you can provide the links in the chat for everybody. Absolutely, I'll drop them in there. Yes. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. And um, great job on the time. And I think we have uh, only one question. Sure. Uh, you did answer it, yeah. And um, Yes. So yeah, so what are, uh, are you aware of any VR apps that can incorporate, incorporate sign language inspired hand gestures? If you can provide us a, a couple of that. Yeah, so I was just um, answering Gregory here. Um, I think that there's a, a challenge with a just capturing the, the hand motions right now. Um, it's still, it takes some pretty advanced technology to do it that a lot of people aren't going to have access to. Um, that certainly you wouldn't want to make the minimum necessary to, to be able to use an interface. Um, and then even then, uh, apparently, and you know, I I don't sign myself, so I'm I'm trusting what what folks have, have told me on this. But um, you know, a lot of people sign in very very slightly different ways, different um, kind of regional accents, different individual uh, personalities when it comes to to signing. Um, and so, being able to simply transfer what your hands are doing one to one to a virtual environment um, and letting other people interpret it that. Uh, is going to be better than trying to like identify exactly the sign for you know for example the sign for TV and use that to turn a TV on and off. Um, but I'm I'm happy to talk more about that in the in the hub's room. Yeah, thank you, and we are uh, looking forward to that. And uh, so this concludes our session for today. And I would like to thank all our presenters for dedicating their time for this session, and our interpreter as well for their services. And um, I would like to encourage everybody uh, to go to the symposium demo sessions, which is uh, next in line. So you can please join us for a variety of displays and you can join these demos either using the Eventbrite page and there's also a live stream on our Facebook and YouTube channel. So thank you all for being here and have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. And Bye. can we put the um, the hubs link in the chat here? I'm not sure which room we're going to. Yeah, sure. The uh, right. next is the demo session. Um, so uh, those are uh, those links, as uh, Reham said, are in um, the Eventbrite. And then if you would like to head to the student um, hubs rooms, um, we had, um, I'm typing that in right now. Um, Do you need me to post the links for this? I got that. Thank you. Um, we hadn't officially uh, scheduled a uh, hubs rooms after flash talk. Um, so we might have people spread out a little bit, but uh, if the panelists here would like to go into the first room, um, anybody who's an attendee is welcome to go engage with them. So uh, thanks everybody, thanks Reham and all our panelists. Uh, Flash Talks always um, engage me to wanna follow your work more. So I look forward to seeing the progress. Perfect, yeah, thanks for having us.